Good morning, Buffalo. Dear friends, dear members, dear members of the board of directors, dear member, members of the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, dear visitors from near and far, welcome to the Buffalo AKG. My name is Yannis Seren, and I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the director of this amazing art museum. We are here today to talk about bridging and building community and how physical bridges and how physical architecture can do that. But before we get to that part about physical bridges and parks and the material aspects of what so many people in this audience are engaged with, I'm going to talk about, for just a few minutes, about the magic of the human spirit. I had the pleasure about, oh, seven, eight years ago, thanks to a fellow called Edouard Manet, to meet one of the most amazing people I have ever had the privilege to meet. Now, some of you in the audience will say, how could Edouard Manet, this French painter from the 19th century, serve as an introducer between you and someone who is so amazing. Well, Mary Wilson was here at the museum. We had a show called Monet and the Impressionist Revolution. And there was Mary having a conversation with a painting by Edward Monet. And I walked up to Mary, introduced myself to this incredible, incredible individual and then we were off to the races. Let me say a few things about Mary. Mary is the person you want to have with you when you jump out of an airplane, whether one that's healthy or unhealthy. She's the one you want to play a round of golf or tennis with. She'll beat you, but she'll do so graciously and always recognizing you as the more talented one. She's the one who transforms and uplifts community, not the one necessarily where she happens to be living, but other communities as well. Her heart is larger than life, and we are so grateful to have an individual such as Mary Wilson as a community leader, as a friend, and as someone with gentle guidance who teaches us all to be better human beings. Mary, you are a rock star. I was going to say, please join me in welcoming Mary to the stage, but you did it instinctively because I'm streaming my thoughts and you know how special she is. So Mary, the podium is yours. Monet is because Ralph collected Monet, Manet, Sisley, and I lived around them for a while until they were sold <laughs> in London um, for um, uh, the trust. And uh, so amazing to be a part of Buffalo and very hard. Those are beautiful words. I hope I can live up to them. And. Um, um, here I am today on this absolutely glorious day, and the bridge is here. And <laughs> it didn't happen by accident. Uh, there were over 200 working on it, workers working on it that evening a couple of weeks ago to get that bridge up. And I was just talking. Um, Someone, they love, I think it was Clotilde, Clotilde um, B. Deckers here, who is a fellow uh, uh, philanthropist of the year, Clotilde. <laughs> but she loves to just drive under the bridge. She goes and she turns around, drives under it again, you know. So I, I can't wait to drive under the bridge, but the I, what I really can't wait to do is walk across that bridge in 2006 
with uh, uh, com uh, connecting communities. And speaking of connecting communities, that's what this is about. <coughs> Excuse me, we're right here, right with, uh, right next to the Ralph Wilson Town Square, which I'm so proud of because it is what Ralph did. He connected communities with, you know, he came with his love of football and truly uh, a um, amazing thing, not only to bring what he brought here, but to continue bringing community together in even broader aspects. And that's what we were so excited about with the AKG, how, how they connected with community. What, what does community want? And here we have a space right next door, which you can just walk through and, um, and just enjoy um, Amstead's creation and uh, the AKG. But today, um, we're here to um, have a wonderful um, invisible panel discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing, you know, uh, I was very fortunate in the beginning in 2017 to be part of the committee to select uh, Michael Van Valkenburg and uh, there were five of us and it was so, and, and then to see where it is today in Detroit and here, once again, bringing community together and asking community what they wanted and so very important. And now we're so lucky to have Katie Campos, who is <laughs> who is the uh, executive director of the Ralph Wilson Conservancy and has just, we could not have picked a more incredible person. And let me tell you, uh, how, she's lost about 60 pounds because she just had a baby. <laughs> thank you, Mary, and thank you, Yane, for hosting us in this beautiful space. Mary, Ralph certainly believed in Buffalo unconditionally, and you are an unshakable force for Buffalo, and we are incredibly grateful. Ralph Wilson Park is a manifestation of your belief, of Ralph's belief, of the Foundation's belief that we, Buffalo, deserves the very best. A beautiful, beautiful place to live, to connect, and to play. So who is the Ralph Wilson Park Conservancy and why are we all here today? The Ralph Wilson Park Conservancy is the nonprofit that will work on behalf of the city of Buffalo to manage Ralph Wilson Park. We are the outgrowth of the community-driven design focus group, Imagine LaSalle. Once the park begins opening in 2026, we will be the organization that keeps it clean, safe, and beautiful. And between now and then, we are ensuring that even more of the community is even more engaged in the park's transformation. The community designed it, the community will program it, and the community isn't just along for the ride, they're truly driving this process. So the community's number one priority in transforming LaSalle Park was a safer, more welcoming way to access the park. The new Ralph Wilson Park Bridge is that promise delivered. We're going to watch a short video about Buffalo's newest architectural gem. It's a huge commitment. It's a huge challenge to try to do a big change to a park like this. We have a park and we have a neighborhood divided from the park by an expressway. So if you're gonna beat that, you're gonna do it with an, a front door that makes no, no ambiguity. We, we, we are the front door, here's the way. We are structural engineers and we design bridges around the world and we have teamed up in this case with the park designer to design these beautiful connections over the I-190. The superstructure itself is made of 100% steel. The bridge is 220 tons, 265 feet long, which is nearly 90 yards. So if you can picture it in a football field, I think Josh Allen might actually be able to throw it as far as the, uh, the bridge extends. The fabrication of the bridge actually started about a year ago with one of our trade partners, Chimalai. The bridge was fabricated in Italy. They have a state-of-the-art facility there and it was really cool to, to see it in action and, and being made. At that point, it was shipped over the ocean on a cargo ship. 
transferred into barges where it was sent down the Erie Canal. From seeing the concept when different architects came from around the world presenting their ideas to uh, the selection and, and following it through from the construction in Italy and then the travels from the Atlantic through our Erie Canal system, the historic journey it made, and then when it finally arrived here with the fanfare, it was just amazing. Those barges arrived right here at our shoreline where they were unloaded, welded together. We utilized self-propelled mobile transporters to move the bridge on site here. The bridge was able to move from its assembly area to its staging area right next to the abutments in only about 20 minutes. Probably the biggest challenge should be all the coordination required with the different authorities in the area. In order to put the bridge up, we had to shut the entire Interstate 190 down for 13 hours, as well as erect the bridge over an active railway. Hundreds of people, hundreds of people, and you know, I can think of at least a dozen entities, from the design team, to the ownership group, to our trade contractors, to the local authorities that we had to coordinate to make this happen. It was really, really a big effort. The bridge under the construction lights, and you could see the cranes moving behind and the sparks flying from them cutting up and demoing the old bridge and it just was, it was really a moment. The City of Buffalo holds and administers the construction contract here for the park. They've been an incredible partner and they've been by our side every step of the way. I think at every facet of this journey, the community input was vital. The feedback of the community was very much based on the previously existing bridge, you know. People felt unsafe. You had a lot of switchback. You don't know who was on the bridge. This is what we want to change. We want to open it up. And therefore, it's a rather transparent bridge. Even so, we have these punched blades. You can see that it's actually rather uh, transparent. We opened up the roof, which connects the two plates or the two arches to to put more light into the, into the bridge. And we added architectural lighting also to it, which uh, also during night, that the people feel very safe on the bridge. This is the most exciting thing in our neighborhood, and this is the place to live now, because this is gonna be just the beginning of uh, the value of living in the vicinity of the new park, and people are gonna want to invest in this neighborhood. The Lower West Side has struggled economically, has been improving incrementally, and now has a front door to a terrific regional park asset. Just can't wait for that first day when people are excited to cross the bridge and, and see the park for the first time. This is a major milestone on the project. It is a, a centerpiece of the park. It is unique to Buffalo. The most important thing I want to say about this bridge is it's the kind of thing that people think about initially and say, you can't do that. You, you can't do that. And we're doing it. Parks foster a stronger sense of belonging and community identity. And this bridge does that. I want to walk on it. <laughs> I can't wait to walk on that bridge. Wait for it. <laughs> it's going to be a bit yet before it's really a fully functioning park. It's only beginning to full flower. We're really grateful to the Ralph Wilson Foundation. This is going to be Ralph's greatest legacy. You can't wait till 2026 comes. You know, when everything's ready to go and we're all able to cross that bridge. Woo, all right. Let's go Buffalo, right? Today, we're gonna to talk about how investments in beautiful, safe public space creates a 100-fold investment in our community health and our economy. You will hear directly from world-renowned leaders in their fields who have focused their efforts on Buffalo and Ralph Wilson Park specifically. So let's get started. Panelists, please join me up on the stage. First, I'd like to introduce Kia Shauku, the Director of Community Engagement at the Buffalo AKG, Yane Seren, the Peggy Pierce Elfin Director at the Buffalo AKG, Michael Stein, Managing Director, Schlack Bergerman Partners, our bridge designers. <laughs> Michael Van Valkenburg, Partner, Creative Director of Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates, the landscape architects of Ralph Wilson Park. 
and JJ Tai, Senior Director, Parks and Trails of the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation. All right, so we each have microphones. Can you all hear us okay? We're gonna go through questions. Panelists, please build on questions so that we're in discussion. Um, and to the audience, you heard it from Mary, you heard it in the video, the community input is what has driven this process. We are going to ask you for your questions and your ideas we see today as a liftoff. We are thinking big, we are thinking boldly, and we can do even more. Um, and what Buffalo might have not thought we deserve nice things, we do. So what's your biggest idea? What's your best question? We'll answer questions at the end of the panel. So JJ. In 2018, the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation announced a $200, a $200 million commitment. $200 wouldn't have built this bridge, but <laughs> you announced a $200 million commitment to Parks and Trails on what would have on Mr. Wilson's 100th birthday, um, which was actually seven years ago Thursday. As that commitment has since been realized in both Detroit and in Buffalo, can you share what have been some essential elements of the process, key moments in the transformation of Ralph Wilson Park? Absolutely, and I think this is one of them. This is a great milestone to, to kind of sit back and realize how far we've come in the last seven, or seven years or so. Uh, but it actually started before that announcement in 2018. I think the first uh, milestone was stepping into City Hall and saying we wanted to do something with a park in Buffalo. Um, and we wanted to do something big, and we talked about how much we were willing to, to invest. And I thought, they thought we were crazy, and we were asked to leave. <laughs> um, but we kept coming back, and it's been a great dialogue since then and a great partnership with the city. And from that point, we worked together to create uh, a representative group, uh, the Imagine LaSalle Focus uh, Group, that went to cities around the country. We went to New York City, saw Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, we went to uh, Chicago, we saw Maggie Daly Park. We went to Cincinnati. We wanted the ability to think big, to bring those ideas back to the city of Buffalo for inspiration on what that design would be. We actually thought initially, I think it was 30 or 40 acres that would be redesigned in the park. Out of that community engagement process, it grew. It grew to not just 30 or 40 acres, what is now 110 acres to include a landing spot for the bridge on 4th Street, uh, but also the bridge itself to create access uh, for the Lower West Side community and for the shoreline, to create a more resilient shoreline. But we needed somebody uh, to take all of that feedback and create this design. And I can remember a moment at the Frank Lloyd Wright Boathouse where we had the Imagine LaSalle team there talking about all of this great stuff uh, with, uh, and we introduced Michael um, in that room and we were, they had a great dialogue of what they had seen in all these cities and what they wanted to try to do and it was just a great dialogue. And then we asked Michael to leave um, and walk out of the room. And it took that group about 10 seconds to say, we want this guy. We want him to work with us to design the park. And it was one of the, the, the greatest moments. And I think you're starting to see that um, as we continued on with that community engagement where they brought the models in every step of the way. So they could be part of that process and see what they were thinking, see how the design was evolving. Um, and have a robust discussion about what they liked and what they didn't. And that evolved into the bridge discussion. That's how ultimately we, we worked with the University of Buffalo Regional Institute to have a competition. And Michael and his team, Michael Stein and his team, were brought in to partner on the bridge. And at every step of the way, it's been an open dialogue about what that community group liked and what they didn't like, what they wanted, what they didn't, what they didn't want. So it's been just a tremendous, uh, a tremendous um, process. But I would say it's not just about those moments. Um, there's probably 20 partners, funding partners, uh, probably more than that. Everything from the city of Buffalo, uh, Empire State Development, New York State, um, the US EPA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Great Lakes Commission, uh, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation. There's so many different agencies and people, uh, locals, the local team, UBRI, uh, the police department, the fire department, everybody in all of these meetings, there was over 200 meetings uh, to talk about every aspect of the park. And what makes me so happy about the process is the engagement across the board, the people. 
Uh, everybody has stayed at the table uh, to have those conversations and work through some really tough things. When you, did, when you want the community to think big, then you come back to the financial, the <laughs> regulatory, and the design limitations. You have to make trade-offs. Uh, but everybody has stayed at the table. And there's two last points I'd like to, like to make. Uh, the last big community meeting with all those partners was um, when we had a really, before the design kind of went into its more technical phase, was February of 2020. Um, we had a, the model out at the, at, at the Waterfront Elementary School and had everybody looking at the design and talking to Michael and his team. And then the next day, everything started to shut down. And there was moments where like, can we keep this going? And I can say that everybody in a remote environment kept working. It's why it's take, it taken so long. It's because it's so technical and there's so many things that had to happen to get it to the point where it could be built. But everybody kept working on that and stayed engaged in that environment. And in those moments, there was questions, can we do this, should we do this? And the overarching statement was, yeah, we can do this, and it's important. We all realized what the importance of those public spaces were during COVID, and the thought was, let's double down on this. Let's figure this out. Let's do this. Um, so that's where it's evolved from. And then lastly, I would just say, one of the, the, the brightest moments in the, in the recent past, uh, with creation of the Conservancy and the hiring of Katie Campos. There was a national search there were candidates from all over the country, and we found one of Buffalo's own. Uh, and it's one of the best decisions that has ever happened uh, to this process as, uh, as we've gone through it. And I'm very excited about her and her team's ability to, uh, to receive this park and operate it and maintain it and program it uh, for years to come in partnership with the city. Thank you. I will share that this LaSalle Park is the park I grew up at, also the park where I sprained a number of ankles on the <laughs> soccer field. And so when the opportunity came to take on this role and work al alongside so many different people in our community, even more people that I've met since then, I thought I knew everybody, um, has been an, a tremendous honor and one that I am benefiting from directly, but I also see so many people who are still using the splash pad who are over on 4th Street asking what's going on, who are just so excited about their backyard, this world-class waterfront park that's now in their backyard. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, Michael Van Volkenberg, thank you for being here. Um, what do you consider to be some of the most important qualities of great public parks? You've been designing parks from Saudi Arabia to South Korea to Tulsa, all over the world. What are some of the greatest qualities? Part of, the, uh, part of what makes a, a park great, of course, is the way that it responds to the people who live nearby and want to use it. And so in the, in the sort of uh, world of cities, uh, you know, parks are incredibly different from one city to the other, but there are things that they share. And um, one of them is that it's welcoming and accessible. And uh, Michael's Bridge, uh, uh, is certainly a big part of uh, making this park feel like it's meant for the people who live nearby, not just people who come in automobiles. But um, uh, when we say a park should be welcoming, uh, first and foremost, we mean that it feels safe when you arrive. Uh, everybody who's you know, leaving their house and walking down a street and going into a landscape wants, when they arrive, um, to know who's there. And that means that it's not a, an intimate space at entries, but it's a very open space. And you can see that in this rendering that combines uh, uh, Michael's Bridge and, uh, and our landscape in the distance where you know, what's going on here is that you can see deep into the landscape and there's great illumination so that at night um, you can make decisions about where you're going and see where other people are. Uh, it's a, it's, I guess it's a, in a way, a gesture of kindness about, about what parks are, that if you're gonna go there, 
you're, you, you, don't, you don't want to be worrying uh, about uh, stepping into the park, but you want to be thinking about the activities that you'll be involved with. We can switch slides. Um, you know, I don't know, I've been making parks since uh, 1989. Uh, not particularly a young person anymore. Um, but um, I don't know that I would have said, so we put these together this week and, and uh, I, there could have been 10 things, I suppose. So when I had to boil it down to five, I guess uh, these are the really important things that, that I think parks have, but people go to parks uh, to feel connected to nature. Uh, and that can happen, of course, we have the magnificent luck uh, of this park being on just this incredible lake and all of the sense of uh, the seasons and temporality and, you know, I mean, you feel so connected to the moment when you're standing next to a large body of water. There's just this uh, I don't want to think. I don't want to say that you feel small, but I think nature feels big when you're standing at the edge of the lake, and I think that's something that makes us all feel good. Um, so connected to nature is certainly part of it. Um, and uh, the other side of that is that uh, there are spaces large and small. Uh, the Tuileries Gardens in Paris weren't initially made to be a public landscape, but they're one of Paris's great landscapes now. And uh, we're, as, as individuals, uh, we're very different. That's one of the premises that you have to accept in park making, that you're making the park for everybody. And some people like intimacy, and they like to be in small spaces, and other people like to be in large, wide open spaces, and I would even say, as our moods shift as individuals, some days we wanna be in a big space with a lot of other people, and then other days maybe we're feeling less great about humanity, and we, <laughs> we wanna find a moment in the park where we feel less connected to everybody that's there. And it has to, it has to span those arcs of um, our differences as individuals. Um, Built for all ages, uh, that's what our, uh, that's what the team of Paloma and our editor distilled from what I said. I said that it had to be built for kids. <laughs> um, and they encouraged me to change it to built for all ages. But I wanna say something about children. Uh, you know, if you were to say, how, how, do, how does a park uh, bring us together as people? Uh, well, uh, in, the, in the climate we currently live in, that's certainly a very big challenge. But I would say, seeing people unlike yourself, loving their children the way you love yours, is one of the most important fundamental connectors. And that's why uh, Places for Kids and Built for All Ages is one of the <laughs> common denominators of great parks. <laughs> the last point, you know, I was thinking about Frederick Law Olmsted making Central Park uh, the first really built, constructed park in the world. There were parks before that. This was one of the first times a huge urban park was made. Um, I don't think they had public meetings like the way we do today. <laughs> and uh, they still did okay with that park. Like, they, they did pretty well. But our parks are always go in new directions by what we learn through, this is when we were designing the gathering place in Tulsa presenting uh, the model, but um, it, it's one of the things that I think will make this park in uh, Buffalo successful is that we heard from so many people about what they wanted. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Michael.
Um, Michael Stein. What are the most important aspects in the design and engineering of bridges that connect communities? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for inviting me this morning. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I want to give you this perspective of especially engineering. That's what I'm, uh, uh, by training, I'm a structural uh, engineer. And I feel um, great infrastructure um, uh, or good infrastructure is only we can only achieve uh, with good engineering. Um, and I think um, we need to attract, again, our young kids um, to also study engineering um, so that we can continue to build and design beautiful infrastructure, which is actually becoming our natural environment in, 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 in cities and parks. And I want to show you a little bit what um, me as, an, as a structural engineer, what, what, what drives our assessment of a good or a bad design. Uh, today I just want to talk about good and try uh, to uh, uh, relate this to, uh, to Buffalo. And uh, you know, one of the bridges I always have to show, it's basically uh, project number one for my firm, um, a bridge in, in India, in, in Calcutta. Uh, which spans the Hooghly River. It's actually the second Hooghly River bridge. That sounds already crazy because uh, it's a big city and it, this is obviously the second bridge they actually built. Um, and what we need to do uh, there, um, w w what our first assessment always is, is how well does the bridge fit into a local context? Um, and that could be a design decision, how it looks like. Um, uh, that could also be a certain material uh, uh, restrictions you, you have and in this particular case. Uh, the community ask us to please use local steel, uh, which is produced um, massively in, in, in Calcutta. However, that steel is not weldable, which is obviously for an engineer this time a catastrophic uh, <laughs> outcome. Um, uh, we had to adjust in that uh, or, or adapt to this kind of conditions and designed a riveted bridge, which is a technology which long has, ab has been abandoned. And I was uh, lucky enough to uh, spend a couple of months on this, uh, uh, on this bridge and, uh, uh, and was probably the last young engineer who learned how to check rivets um, on, um, on a construction site. So in, in Buffalo, it was obviously not the material, but uh, in Buffalo, the local context is, is, is the historic context. You have so many beautiful bridges, engineering marvels, you know, from the Peace Bridge to all the other bridges when you uh, drive along the I-190, and we wanted to relate to that to an extent that you obviously see that this is a, the Peace Bridge is an arch bridge, our bridge is an arch bridge. Um, but we also wanted to relate to the architecture, and you have these beautiful buildings, you know, I think about the terracotta facade of the Sullivan Guarantee Building, for example, or uh, Frank Lloyd's White Tree of Lights, and all these things, and even the, we discussed this morning uh, when I got the uh, beautiful guide through the, through, the, uh, uh, through the museum, about the outlets of the, uh, the, the, the air conditioning in the museum, all have these patterns, um, these beautiful patterns, and we were, um, obviously trying to adapt to that and included the pattern in our design. If you continue the next. The other one is how well does the structure actually, or, uh, is there a harmony between architecture and engineering, say, you know? I mean, there typically there's uh, some functional requirements. In this particular case, this is a bridge in South Carolina. There's a beautiful, in Greenville, there's a beautiful waterfall down there and they wanted to create more or less a balcony where you can walk and you don't, you, the, the views are not obstructed by, by, by structure. You can just look at this, this beautiful um, uh, waterfall. And um, it, it should also be a curved structure and we designed a bridge which is only supported on one side. If you look at this closely, you see that the cables are only on one side. This is only possible. This is only possible because the bridge is curved. So we don't want to just react to obstacles by uh, somehow engineer. We want to benefit out of uh, that. And uh, we see in, in, in structural engineering very often that certain circumstances have been used to benefit uh, structurally um, uh, uh, from that. In Buffalo, it was kind of that uh, situation that we crossed the uh, I-110, and uh, this is not the most beautiful spot of the park to be right on top of the I-110. And we wanted to provide certain kind of protection also when you go over there, so that you perhaps not even realize that you transition from one park to another. So therefore, we created these plates on the side, which on the one hand side were a structural element, on the other hand, they're also an architectural, and actually perhaps the defining moment of the, of the project, 
but it's a very much a structural um, uh, component of the bridge. If you go to the next slide, uh, a project in Portland, in, not in Portland, it's a project in Toronto, which we also did together with uh, Michael's um, firm, and they asked us about, they asked us to do an iconic bridge. Obviously, it's a big city, and they wanted to have something iconic, and it was actually for four bridges, and they said one of them should be iconic. I feel always this is a very dangerous proposition because uh, uh, the one you do iconic and the rest you do dumb, or what, how do you approach that? Uh, it's a very difficult thing. So we proposed to them to do uh, something appropriate, uh, a, a, an arch structure out of plates, um, and we were able to design four iconic bridges in that respect. I think there are more to see if you go forward there. Yeah. Uh, and we adapted, the system, we adapted the bridges to different uh, situations and could build a family of bridges uh, out of that. So, um, and, and, and this was still in budget. So that means a good design uh, it can also be, or should be also affordable, a very important proposition um, uh, for bridges, obviously. The next aspect, and I think this is another project with Michael, it's the Tulsa bridge uh, in, in Oklahoma, which is also related to the appropriateness of design. This is obviously a beautiful river, and uh, engineers might have the, the urge to actually just span this uh, uh, river in one go, which would be a massive, a huge structure, which would not at all fit into the local context, would be super expensive, and is not at all necessary. So we very soon discussed together that this should be something uh, with much smaller spans, uh, uh, and, and, and much simpler on the one hand side, but not dumb again. And we created a bridge, I think we have another picture of this, with a super slender arch out of just a three inch plate structure, which is only possible because the spans are short on the one hand side, and on the other hand, um, they, uh, you, 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 you have creative engineers and creative architects to work together to find a, a, solution, um, a solution like that. And then the next one, I put this criteria at last, even though it's probably the most important one. You can design the most beautiful bridge and the most affordable bridge. If nobody wants to use it, um, that is a, a big uh, failure, obviously, and that's uh, what we want to um, avoid. So we need to design user-oriented. Um, in this particular bridge, which is a rendering, we will soon finish it in, in Indianapolis. The brief, the competition brief, asked us to design a four-lane bridge. Um, and uh, we could have just continued to do that, but we started to have a community engagement, very similar to what we did in Buffalo. And the community told us, you know, there are all these bridges, four-lane bridges, uh, car uh, vehicular bridges, and we get this five-foot sidewalk on the side. We don't feel safe, uh, we, and, and, and we don't use these bridges, really. I mean, how, what can we do to actually improve that? And we convinced the owner in this type, in this case, 16 Tech, to actually reduce the number of lanes from four to two, and use the remaining space for intermodal traffic. That means this is the first vehicular bridge, uh, which has actually 51% of its service, uh, surface dedicated to uh, intermodal traffic, especially the pedestrian traffic, but also community spaces on the bridge, because in this particular area we are, um, we, uh, uh, it's a very beautiful spot where you might want to rest. And for Buffalo, the feedback was clearly safety. I mentioned this already in the video. Everybody felt unsafe to cross the existing bridge. It was too narrow it, with the fence, the switchbacks. You never saw what is actually going on on the bridge, and it was purely lit during the night. And all this we want uh, to change by making the bridge wider, making it transparent. By, after the community engagement meeting, we actually cut the big holes in the, in, in, in the roof because we wanted to make it even lighter during the day also. And we introduced uh, a, a, a lighting, an LED lighting system, which will not only show you the way, but which will light you in a way that you recognize faces, the faces of people which come, which, 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 which you meet on the bridge. And this is an experience um, we, uh, we, we think is super important um, to make a bridge successful and that people feel, uh, feel safe. Thank you. What has been um, really awesome to hear from our community is how the, how the community actually feels like they designed the park and the bridge, reinforcing everything you've said. We have 
two of the um, most well-renowned, world, world-renowned landscape architect, bridge designer, structural and engineer firms up here. And in the days following the placement of the bridge, we heard from people, first of all, we heard from people, this is our iconic bridge. This is our iconic bridge. We were seeding that, but then they said it back to us and it felt like this is, that since the Peace Bridge 100 years ago, this is an architectural asset. You heard from the community. Um, the safety piece, the access that we, the community didn't say, hey, we deserve nice things. They said, we don't feel safe, it's ugly. Um, we've heard from a lot of parents, I don't feel comfortable sending my kids over that bridge. I don't feel comfortable with my kids being at LaSalle Park without me there. And then what you both shared, that it, we created, you created what now our community said, we designed this beautiful bridge because you heard from them when they said, I don't feel safe, you said, you deserve this wide open, beautiful bridge. You deserve this wide open entrance to the park with this new viewpoint of the lake. So thank you for not only listening to our community, but empowering our community to now say, hey, we did this. And we haven't even seen the half of it yet. Um, Yane. The Buffalo AKG Art Museum recently underwent a transformation of its own. Can you share a bit about how that transformation, one of Buffalo's oldest cultural assets, has connected our community? I can, but I can also say that JJ, Michael, and Michael have addressed almost all the points that I was going to talk about. So let me try to pull some of these strands together. Go to saunas. Well, uh, I was going to Wait mention saunas, saunas, in fact. <laughs> yes. um, the task of architecture, design, and art is ultimately to give form to a human idea, something that we've thought about, something that we've experienced, felt. How do we translate that idea into a physical form, whether it be a painting, a bridge, or a building? That's the question that artists, designers, architects, and engineers work with. Now the challenge is that as a humanity, our ideas are not always aligned. We have lots of different types of ideas. And also our ideas evolve and change with time. And the architecture or the design of one moment may not always reflect or echo the thought patterns and ideas of another moment. And yet, we want to live as healthy, vibrant, safe communities together, but we struggle with this question of how do we bring the ideas of one moment in alignment with the ideas of another moment. So on the screen now you have a picture taken from an airplane in 1942 during the days of World War II when the Elizabeth and Robert Wilmer's building was the only building that was home to what then was called the Albright Art Gallery. And it was nestled within this beautiful Olmsted Park with pathways connecting the Hoyt Lake side to the Elmwood Avenue side of the campus. But as times evolve and as artists come up with new ideas and as the community itself is growing, the museum starts to also think about growth. So the way we went about growth is, first of all, understanding history. You can't look into the future if you don't understand where you're coming from. And for us, we approach this understanding of history through all of you, all of you who are residents or live and have made your lives here in Western New York. We did that in casual conversations. I may have you know, struck a conversation with one of you when I was running on the east side or west side or in Delaware Park and asked you about the museum. Or we did it more formally to, through town hall meetings where we actually solicited the feedback of members of our community about the museum. And there are things that we heard. We heard things like, we are so proud of this famous museum that's here in Buffalo, but I haven't really been there since I was in high school. And it's not really my place. It's not really a, I don't really belong there necessarily, but I'm very happy that it's here in Buffalo. So there was this notion of something of an elitist flair around the museum that didn't make the museum welcoming to everyone. We heard things like, you know, there used to be a staircase on the west side of the Wilmers building, the 1905 neoclassical building. There used to be a staircase there, but then it was taken away. 
Why was it taken away? Well, that was what happened in 1962, but we heard from people memories of something that had been lost. So this notion of something that has been lost, but that architecture and design could bring back was prominently felt. People would say things like, we hate that parking lot. We use the parking lot, but we hate it. It's ugly. It stands in front of one of the most beautiful buildings in our community, and we love to park there, but it's so damn ugly. Uh, we heard things about the sort of notion of inaccessibility into the museum. So what we learned by engaging our community was that if we now go and run a design competition and feed all these magnificent ideas that we have heard from our community, and of course what we were cognizant of our own sort of museum operator needs at the same time, how could any architect come up with a design that responds to all of those thoughts that were expressed by all of you. So we did something a little bit radical. We didn't run a design competition. We ran a competition for an architectural partner. It's, I think, one of the first times it was done in an art museum context in the United States and perhaps anywhere in the world. So basically, we asked a group of architects to make three proposals responding to different types of architectural challenges. But then we told the architects that we're not going to build anything that you propose necessarily. We said to them that we are looking for a partner, and then once we have a partner, together with the museum, our board, our staff, and the community, we'll end up designing the museum. That's, why, that's how OMA and Shohei Shigematsu specifically was chosen as our partner, and we, went, we took it on a more granular level than just picking a firm. We identified the specific individuals who presented to us because it's those individuals that we had the partnership with, not a big firm that has a thousand employees around the world. So we really wanted that partnership. And then the other thing that we did is that every time as the design progressed, we would release drawings and renderings through the media and at public meetings to the community, again, something that architects usually don't like to do until they are done with designing, but we released renderings all along the way, which meant that the community could react, sometimes with anger and vehemence, I might add. No, we don't want that. And that's what we ended up doing. We would pivot. It cost money in that process of design to go back to the drawing board to redesign. But I think that one of the reasons why our campus is today much loved, not just by architecture critics, but those of you who use it, is because we made so many tweaks and changes to the design along the way that it really became a collaborative process. The end result responded not to every single one of the thousands of ideas that we heard, but to many of them. For example, why is the new Gunlock building designed as it is. Why does it have this glass veil? Well, museums can be intimidating places. We learned that in our engagement with all of you. What's happening in there? Do I really belong there? Is, could this be my space as well? So I told, or we told, OMA and Shohei Shigematsu, we want a museum that looks porous, but one that also keeps the art safe. So inside the new Gunlag building, you have basically a, a cube in the middle where we can show the art, but the cube is surrounded by a transparent veil. So when you are looking at the building from the outside, you can actually see people there. You can imagine yourself being one of those people in the building. And when you are one of the people in the building, you can look into the park at Elmwood Avenue, at Delaware Park, and you can feel a sense of, I was just there, there's a connection between me here in the museum and the park out there, so it helps orient yourself within the context of the museum. So it was a way of breaking down the hermetic wall of the museum without getting your feet wet while you are inside it. That was the idea behind this glass veil. And then the bridge. The bridge was, people kept saying, don't destroy the facades of the 1905 building. We love that building. It's the marble queen of Buffalo. So how do you 
connect the campus without damaging or touching as lightly as possible the facades of the beautiful 1905 building. That was how we came up with the bridge, or how OMA came up with the bridge. The bridge has now become one of these beloved architectural elements where ki kids love to run through it, and they would you know, take their skateboards in there if they were permitted. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but it, it serves, it gives an architectural design identity to an idea. The idea was from the community. The architects, us, the designers together came up with the form that gave shape to that idea. Um, this was what the parking lot looked like. I mean, I, we heard it so many times. I mean, this was not a nice way to confront one of the most beautiful buildings, not just in this town, but anywhere. But this is, in addition to creating new public space open to the public and bringing back that historic staircase that was demolished in 1961, we created one of the things we heard, don't take parkland when you build. Don't occupy more parkland. Well, we are very proud to say that we repatriated more parkland than what we had when we started by burying the parking lot. Yes, it was damn expensive, $110,000 per parking spot, but <laughs> we got more green space and we returned the 1905 building to its old glory. Um, okay, last point, 62 building. The 62 building, in terms of its visitor flow was always a challenge. And one of the reasons why it was, I think, a little bit intimidating for people to come to the museum is you'd walk in from the west side, there would be a front desk, behind the front desk, black tinted glass windows. And as you walked in, somebody would ask you, with all good intent, are you a member? Mm, no. Okay, the tickets are this and this price. Then you get your ticket, you turn left or right, it's not a political decision. There wasn't a way to slip into the museum casually in an unintimidating way. In addition to that, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful, to have an open air sculpture garden or sculpture courtyard, if you live in Florida. But, you know, if you live in Buffalo and you can get, as we well know, those of us who live here, six feet of snow in a day, that sculpture garden, marvelous as it may be, is unusable several months of the year. In fact, the rule at the museum used to be back in the day that once first snow fell, no footstep, no footprint could be seen in the pristine landscape of that snow. Well, that sounds a little bit exclusive. So, we wanted to cover it. I'm going to share something a bit more bluntly than I usually do. We wanted to cover it and we were told we can't because it's a listed building. It's a listed building, and you can't like architecturally edit a listed building by slapping a roof on it. So I asked the powers to be if I could put sculpture into that space. And they looked at me and said, Janne, we deal with architecture. You deal with sculpture. And I said, clarifying question, can I put big sculpture there? I said, <laughs> not our domain. We deal with architecture. You are the curators and whatnot, and you deal with the art. So I flew to Berlin, spoke to Olafur Eliasson, and said, Olafur, I need a damn big piece of sculpture that can serve as rain cover. And that's how we got our common sky and the Ralph C. Wilson Town Square that has become one of the most popular spaces in the museum. And uh, all the authorities to be also fine with it. And I think that now if somebody tried to take it away, then Buffalo would truly revolt. Because this has become the space where people feel at home. It's easy to access. There's no admission fees. You can slip into it. You can spend 30 seconds there or the day there. It's up to you. And that notion of a common sky, everything that JJ, Michael, and Michael have spoken about, how do we build community? How do we pe bring people together? How do we use design, architecture, engineering to create a synergy among a, a group of people that may not always share the same ideas, but still want to have community? So thanks for listening to these notes uh, about how we build community. And <laughs> I was just telling Yane earlier today that while I grew up a few blocks away from the museum, um, we rarely came. We did come, and it was wonderful, but it was very isolating. And now our three-year-old twins come every week with a group of 
nannies and their charges. And when we were just here, my wife and I were just here for First Friday a few weeks ago, and our son was grabbing our hand saying, let's go. He actually called her Mar Mary Bell instead of Marisol, because I think he's been watching a little too much Encanto. But he now, <laughs> at three years old, has his own favorite work of art, pulling us up to the third floor to try to see it. So it's the town square is packed every day. It's incredible how this is now a place of sometimes very loud joy and people coming together. And it's been an inspiration to us as we're thinking about how to engage the community at Ralph Wilson Park. So thank you. Um, Kia. Yes. Good We've morning. heard from Yane about how the community has really informed many of the architectural decisions in the transformation of the AKG. As the community engagement director, how has that impacted your work? And how has the community responded to seeing their input in action? Thank you. I think that's really the test of everything that we've discussed this morning. We can talk about concepts and theory about how we imagine uh, or intend things through our design, but what it's, how it's actually used will ultimately determine what it is. And what I found since coming here at the AKG and working, having the privilege of serving as Director of Community Engagement is that the, the public, we're here. They're here and they're enjoying our space. They're, um, and. I think because the design was built, the museum, especially the town square, was built, um, was informed by the community's voice. We see not only that the way that it's used is is um, is indicative of the, that feedback and the guiding. So, for example, the slide that you see up here is from a performance that we had two Fridays ago. Uh, this is a performer, Drea Denour, and she's performing a requiem for our suffering in the town square. This event was attended by 416 people. You can't see them, they're not on camera. And that was a resounding success, right? The community um, came together to c close out and to think about, reflect on the tragedy of May 14th and we were able to provide a space in which they could, there was catharsis that they could actually explain, experience all the ranges of emotion and it was one of the most beautiful things I've seen here. And I think that that event demonstrated that um, there's an understanding and um, a willingness to, um, to be here at the museum and that there's a place for everyone and that the space is actually driving um, community in a very strong and important way. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, more, more can be said to that. <laughs> I feel like I should, but I, honestly, I feel like so much has already been said, and I don't want to uh, be repetitive, but I think it's important to to note that, I mean, Yanni alluded to it, like, for so long, people felt like there wasn't a place for me. But when you have a building like the Gunlock building that literally says, you are welcome here, you can come, you, it changes the narrative. It makes my job easier. It's easy to say, no, there's a place for you. Look, we built it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or when someone wants to... Um, as, as Yanni alluded to, come into the town square and not feel like I have to be a member. I have to have a reason to be here. The space becomes something different. And so we start to invent reasons for people to come. So like every Thursday, people will come and I'm very proud of this, play spades in the town square. And that's not something that people think about when they think about a museum. But for me and my job of creating community and building community, this is a tool that we leverage and we say, you know that thing that you like to do? Come do it with us. And it could be pl people playing chess. Um, we have live music in our town square every Thursday, which again, another draw, another way to signal to the community the things that you love, we love it too. Come enjoy them with us. And I think that's how you build meaningful community. I think that's how you um, change the way people see themselves. And I think that's the way people change the way people see community and understand community. And I mean, I think you've, you've said this several times, Katie. It's a way to signal to everyone who's in the city and the region that we deserve nice things and we deserve beautiful things and these beautiful things are for them. And I, I mean, I love it. My job is easy because I work in a beautiful place. <laughs> I, I would also add to what Kia is saying that, you know, she's literally a pioneer in a field that didn't exist in art museums. Go back 10 years, 15 years in time, or 100 years, there were no positions such as director of community engagement in an art museum. Yes, we had curators, we had maybe educators, uh, museum 
preservation and safety individuals, but we didn't have directors of community engagement. So Kia and the museum as a whole under her leadership in that community engagement realm is pioneering an entirely new discipline. And every day is a learning experience in that field because we've built this thing based on the feedback. We've tried to integrate those ideas into the engineering, design, and architectural frame. But then it takes the genius of humans, individuals such as Kia, to operationalize those ideas, to make the magic happen. And you know, if you're the you know, first art museum in the world, the Louvre Public Art Museum, opens its doors in August of 1793. If you are the director of the first museum in the world, you don't know what the hell you're doing because there's no <laughs> precedent to what you're doing. Who do you look to? There wasn't a guy or a lady before you. Mm. So you're in a sense having to carve out and build a space. And that's what you know, Kia is doing together with other departments in the museum. But that's the sort of stuff that is really on the cutting edge of things because you're having to create a new discipline. I think I'm, yes. I want to add to that just a little bit. I think it's, and thank you, by the way, for saying that. Um, I think that inviting community to have a voice and actually letting them see the fruit of their voice is itself new. I think for so long, so many well-intended people just did things and they did good things and to varying degrees of success and we sort of didn't really have a way of assessing, well, why didn't that land the way we intended it? Why, did, why didn't the people engage with this thing that we wanted? But it's a different thing altogether to ask the community when it's being designed, have a voice. We want to hear wh how you will use it. What is your vision? And that is so empowering. It's not something being done with two people, but it's being done with people. And when you do that, we do have ownership. We do have an ownership stake. There will be people who will be policing that park for no other reason than it's theirs, because they were there when it was being planned. They were there when the bridge came up. And then you will see the beauty, not just the beautification, but you'll see people will walk a little taller and their head will be held a little higher because there's something beautiful. There's a gem in their backyard that belongs to them. And it's a beautiful process. That is actually a perfect segue into warming up the audience to hear your ideas and your questions. So you've heard it loud and clear. Um, these projects are driven by community. Community is truly at the heart of the transformation of the AKG, now the transformation of Ralph Wilson Park. As JJ and I have talked about a lot, Michael Van Valkenburg has really taught us a really big lesson that parks are living, breathing projects. They are not designed and complete. They are canvases that we can work on for generations, um, as long as we keep to those elements that bring people together. And so I wanted to ground us in what the Ralph Wilson Park Conservancy, our belief, how we're thinking about this. Um, so in one of the most segregated and isolated communities in the country, Buffalo, right? We heard from the Community Foundation rec um, Racial Equity Roundtable a few years ago about our isolation index. On any given day, you have about a 10% chance of having a meaningful interaction with someone who doesn't share your background. Ralph Wilson Park will be a place where on any given day, 100% of the time, you will have a meaningful interaction with someone who doesn't share your background. And I think, Michael, you said this beautifully, that when you can see how people who don't look like you love their children, something that makes your heart grow for yourself, you, you immediately connect with them, you build trust across lines of difference. And the way we see it is that when we have kids who come to Ralph Wilson Park, who every day are engaging on this incredible playground, wait till you see it, it is gonna blow your mind, but who are playing together. The best way to build trust is through play. It's you can take hundreds of hours of DEI classes or you can go play with somebody and you build trust in an instant. So our kids across from as diverse as Buffalo is, everyone's gonna be there, right? Everyone was already at LaSalle Park. We hear from people on the east side, this was their park. So we have kids coming together to play across lines of difference. All those parents, those grandparents, their caretakers are seeing their kids, they're talking. So those kids, our kids who are growing up in Buffalo now, at Ralph Wilson Park, playing across lines of difference, building trust together. They will be our city's future leaders. And can you imagine a Buffalo when kids who grew up building trust with people who don't look like them are making decisions for our community? 
and how different of a place that will be. And that's why Ralph Wilson Park, that's why we're gonna keep it clean, safe, and beautiful. We'll take care of the stuff behind the scenes, but it's gonna be a place that is welcoming, that is accessible, and we are thinking big, right? We've completed the first major phase of the design. Um, and so I wanna share that we uh, share a story, and Yane, tee you up to, so that the audience now learns that you are also an expert in saunas, so we'll get there in a second. But our team was able to travel to Copenhagen to take some inspiration, and Copenhagen um, is actually really, really cold and really rainy the majority of the year. And what we found when we first landed there is that nearly everybody rides their bike, or, or they walk, or then they take the train. As a last resort, they might drive. When it's cold, when it's rainy, we rode our bikes through sleet and 30 degree weather. There are dedicated bike highways. Um, in Copenhagen, people swim year round in their harbor. Um, in 20 degree weather, we actually jumped into the harbor on our last day. Um, and lining those harbors are these beautiful public saunas. And so Yane, as an expert in saunas, one big idea we have is to one day, what if we put a public swimming area fence with an in, in water fence around um, the Black Rock Channel in, the, in around the park that you could jump in and go for a swim in the coldest of Buffalo days. How, does sauna, how do saunas bring community together? If you do that, <laughs> I mean, it will be the most transformative thing that has happened in an American park in a long, long time. Okay, I'm going to do this very briefly. Helsinki, same latitude line as Anchorage. We are up there. Buffalo and Barcelona. I moved south of the Alps when I came here. Finland has a population of 5.5 million people. There are more than 3 million saunas in Finland, which means that there are several per family. Saunas are intergenerational and intercommunal spaces. They, are, they used to be the places where you were born and where you died, because that was, in the pre-hospital days, the most hygienic environment to deal with illness as well as coming into this world. Sauna is something to us Finns which is, an, importantly, an asexual space. We go there as families, kids, parents, grandparents, all together, all genders together. It doesn't matter. We are there together. And we are there with friends and with extended family. And it's an asexual space. We do not, like it's ingrained in our thinking that we don't bring this notion of sexuality into the space of sauna. It builds community like no other architectural edifice that I have seen anywhere. Because so many of our interactions are, are premised on things that are really kind of superfluous to the nature of being a human. We're not born with our suits on, and our suits don't matter, or our costumes, dresses don't matter when we pass. And, and I think Finland has kept its sort of hook on that idea of what it means to be a human being. And, uh, you know, I, I, I could go on about saunas, but they are spaces, yes, hot, and when you plunge into 33-degree water, cold. I do that in my backyard here in Buffalo on Depew Avenue if you want to come and take a look. Uh, I build a sauna there. Uh, the health benefits are enormous. I mean, you can read Google, health benefits of saunas. The, the list of articles from scientific journals is long. But it's really about bringing people together. It's also the endorphins that a sauna experience releases is, is just something that if you haven't experienced, it's, it's hard to describe in words. Saunas are not meant to be expensive. They're not meant to be elitist. They're not meant to be exclusionary. They are meant to be places where people from all parts of society. You can go to a Finnish public sauna and suddenly there's the CEO of Nokia and a steel worker and a kindergarten teacher mingling around in the same space. If you are going to public saunas, yes, one for men, one for women, women uh, but uh, most people also have these family saunas or saunas in their homes and that's where you know, the, the communality gets even more pronounced. So it's it's a, certainly a good example to think about as a way of bringing people together. And, you know, summer and winter. Uh, it's very healthy in the winter because it's good for your circulation. 
And in the summer, you know, it's nice to plunge anyway, so. Well, Yane will be leading that task force for Buffalo. Um, I want to connect the dots because I realize that I might have left you all hanging on why are we talking about Asana at Ralph Wilson Park. Um, like JJ said at the beginning, what was once the beginning was a 20 to 30, million, 30 acre redesign of LaSalle Park. Um, the community talked about wanting better, safer access, and so the additional infrastructure project was added, this incredible new bridge. As work got underway, where, well, we knew that the one mile waterfront needed some some support, it needed to actually be transformed, right? It's on the end of its life. It, that side of Lake Erie takes on tremendous storms. You might be thinking, well, why, I've heard Lake Erie is not very clean, and also I don't want to go swimming in the Black Rock Channel. Why are you putting a public swim area there? Um, we're not yet. This is a huge, big, bold idea, which is what we want to hear from you about what we can do down at the park. But it's also one that's in, within shot, right? The, the way that we're transforming the waterfront is not only for structural resiliency, the park LaSalle Park used to take on a lot of water. Um, that's actually why I sprained my ankle there playing a number of times. The fields were um, destroyed. If it wasn't flooded, um, the fields were destroyed. But the other reason is this improving the biohabitat, improving the, the lake, making the lake um, more safe for not only people, but for fish and wildlife, which we're now seeing what look like millions of tadpoles. We're hearing from environmental agencies that this is going to be the place for fish to fish for trout. So within 10 years, if that part of Lake Erie protected through the Black Rock Channel is cleaner and more beautiful, could we put a public swim area so you can join Yane on the coldest of days taking a deep plunge and then we can put that public sauna there to better connect our community in even the darkest, coldest days? That's a huge idea that we can run with that will really bring our community together. So now I'll open it up to you. Um, our AKG and Ralph Wilson Park team both have Microphones, if you have a question for our panelists, please raise your hand and we will get you a microphone or a big idea. Down in the front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kaz Rodriguez from the Hispanic Heritage Council of Western New York. First and foremost, thank you very much for this forum. Very informative. You know, our Hispanic Latino community is very fortunate to be on the other end of this bridge connecting the park. And we're a very proud uh, community. As you think about the public art that's going to go on this bridge, uh, I'd like to recommend that uh, some Latino, Hispanic expression is, is evident. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cass. Carl Skopinski, I'd like to thank the uh, Conservancy and also the museum for holding this event. Um, one of the things, I, a couple of things that I, I got from the, the presentations here was one is reconnecting or connecting communities, but also having uh, an understanding you can't really move forward until you, under, you kind of understand the past. It's great that we have the bridge that is going to bridge between the community and the, the park. One of the things I would, uh, which is really nice to see, is you have this heritage engagement project going on. Typically, we, when, we bring, when we build something new, we tend to get rid of the old, right? Everybody wants the new shiny object, but we need to still connect to our history, right? What happened here, especially what happened in Western New York, and Niagara Frontier, I should say, happened nowhere else. Right? It's part of who we are. It's part of our history. It's part of our heritage. One thing I would like to see, and it isn't a big idea, but it is an idea, would be to, and if it hasn't been already, to name the lagoon after LaSalle. And the reason is what happened here for exploration, right, in opening up the continent happened nowhere else. There's a whole history of, of that era. Um, and we're, we tend to kind of get rid of that. Right? We tend to get rid of LaSalle High School and the different, the LaSalle Village in Niagara Falls was kind of, you know, was eliminated when it was absorbed into uh, Niagara Falls. One thing to think about would be is how to connect the park more to the river. We talked about the saunas and kind of getting clean, air, clean water. But think about the heritage. Um, one thing you might want to think about and we do have some uh, programs, animation programs here in Western New York as some of the colleges, 
is to create an AR experience where you can maybe go to the lagoon, hold up your phone or your pad, and see like maybe the Griffin, the Griffin, the, the first European ship that came up Niagara, the Niagara River, which was pulled by the, those who created the ship to go into the Great Lakes. So people can kind of have an experience of what it might have been like at the very, very beginning of why we're here. So I just want to kind of share that with you. It's, it's a simple thing. It's not a great idea, a big, big idea, but it is an idea. So thank you. Yeah, I'll thank you, and I will. We you have a handout of our heritage engagement project, which is thank you for that. The Ralph Wilson Park Conservancy, as we got underway, immediately wound up at the Buffalo History Museum, just looking through the archives to better understand um, what the park was since its beginning. Jan, I told a story today before he took this job. He read through archives from the early 1900s about what was in this place before iterations of it. Um, and we've undertaken a history project called the, the um, Heritage Engagement Project, which you can find on our website um, or on social media, where every month we do a deep dive into parts of the park. Um, it wasn't always a park. It was actually um, a sandy, loamy soil. Then it was the city's gift to the community to build a park. Um, and now, in, in ways that we're both honoring that past and involving the community to transform into something that will continue to be a gathering place for the community. So thank you. I think we have one over here and then Jack right in here too. Um, good afternoon, I'm Mike Bellani. And uh, first off, I would like to commend uh, Mrs. Wilson and the late Ralph C. Wilson uh, Jr. Um, for dedicating these dollars. And to have a philanthropist, to have a sports owner put $1 billion back to our community in Detroit is so unprecedented, and I think our city is, you know, we can't thank you enough, Mrs. Wilson, and I agree, this park is going to be um, Mr. Wilson's legacy. And also, I commend that you hired uh, Ms. Campos, you know, we've gone local, and she's been to the park, and I just applaud all that you and your committee are doing. Your newsletters are great. Um, nearly 40 years ago, wow, getting old, uh, Bob Rich saved professional baseball in Buffalo, and one of his uh, initiatives was to go out into the community with our players and to work with um, uh, youth groups and youth baseball and softball programs. And so we went all over Western New York. And I'll never forget the times that I would go to LaSalle Park and see the youth programs there, the West Side Little League. And what made it much different than any other is that it was an ethnicity of um, Italian kids and Hispanic kids and Native Americans, it was a melting pot in the community. But what really bothered me was that the people that ran the league had to go and make sure that it was maintained. They didn't get good help from the city. And I looked around that great park where I grew up at, and I just said, you know, this is an unpolished diamond. And my wife, who used to work at the um, International Institute, would bring the Bosnians in there, and she said, man, we got to do something to be able to make this park inclusive. I think you're doing that, but what are you doing for baseball and softball um, when it opens? And to that end, one last is, everyone drives by wants to know what, what the end game is. Can't we get that big design and just put it on like huge billboards and put it right next to the 190 so we can see what it's gonna be? And I commend the spot. I'll be on your committee. <laughs> There's a lot to answer there, um, but great, great points. Um, I think uh, there's an initiative with the foundation that we chatted about yesterday, uh, Project Play Western New York, to really understand the landscape of all of those programs that provide those recreational activities for children across the city of Buffalo, and how do you bring them together and lift them up, not just from the field standpoint, but from a capacity standpoint, so they have the resources they need. Um, when you talk about the park, We've had a lot of great conversations with Katie and with Andy Rabb at the city. Um, and it's been a really focused initiative um, on how to redesign those parks to make sure that the playing surfaces are what they need to be. Um, and it's on the radar of Major League Baseball and the Players Association. They've contributed a million dollars to help renovate all of those fields that are there for baseball. Um, and they want to come in after those fields are done to help with some of the, the activities that you're talking about, providing equipment or providing additional programming. They've been great partners for, 
I don't know, it's probably been four years or so that we've had conversations with them. Um, and I think we're not done yet. I think there's an opportunity to partner with the university, right? The UVL, right across the bridge. And how do you engage with all those students that are there uh, in their baseball and softball programs? We've had conversations with them as well. So there's a lot there, but I'm super excited that Katie and the city and, and the partners around the table are, are thinking about it. Just wish we could get it done faster, but we're, there's a lot being done down there from a construction standpoint. And I'll add from a program standpoint, um, I appreciate that that's where that question ended up because our, you should see Westside Little League play. Um, you should see the baseball players, the softball players, the football players down at the park right now. Um, and while the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation seeded, seeded this incredible redesign and transformation, it is, it is on our local partners, including the Ralph Wilson Park Conservancy as a nonprofit to engage those partners and make sure that they have the resources they need to thrive. Um, and they are thriving with very few resources right now. The city has been a, an incredible partner, um, the city of Buffalo, Andy Rabb, in the construction phase of the park, and also in meeting with all of the, the, player, the player groups. Um, Westside Little League has been there since, I think, the 60s as a mainstay. Um, they are still there playing. They might be practicing right now. Hundreds of kids, parents, family members come out every week. Um, they, they are the best stewards of the park. They clean up every single piece of litter that, is, that they drop, um, and they're really, really good players. And we are working with them to make sure that they have a resource in us to either apply for grants, to um, support them, to... They reach a number of kids across the city, um, and they're a great resource. So I think the, the point is that there has been a tremendous amount of work done to make sure this is a thriving place, and it will be on us make it sure it continues to, to be that way. Can I add just one? I guess it's more of an invitation. Um, as the park continues and as Katie continues to engage on the operations and maintenance in the program, but it's an invitation from the, to the community and, the, and those groups to, to in, engage and not let it just be about the design of the park, but about how they want to use the park and how they want the park to evolve over time. So I think that's a, a really important element, that this engagement and these conversations don't stop. Uh, they actually should get more intense as the park starts to open here in a couple of years. I think we have one more question. Time for one more question. Jack. We have a question. One last one. If you didn't hear that in the back, Jack and my parents and his late wife Connie were in Lama's class together, and I am one of the outcomes of that, and they are very proud. Katie, there's also a one more question with a mic over there with Jillian. Hi, I'm Mark McGovern from the Conservancy. I'm new to this conversation, but I'm proud to be standing next to one of my mentors from the School of Architecture and Planning and listening to you folks talk about operationalizing these lofty ideals that they teach us at UB about community engagement, doing great things and making those small plans. And here we are standing in a very manifestation of that. Likewise, what's taking place over at Ralph Wilson Park, I'm honored to be a small cog and a wheel of setting this in motion for generations to come. But one of the questions I wanted to ask of Michael, because I've been on both ends of the bridge and have been involved in the construction here for nine months or so, what was the thought or what drove kind of the elevation changes as you move from east to west, right? You're lower on the east side, you're higher as you approach the west side. Was it a function of cut fill analysis, oh, we need to put some soil here. Was it a, the approach on the 4th Street side to reach a certain elevation? Was it inspiring as you approach a grand vista looking out over the lake? I'm curious in that kind of consideration. Thanks. Which Michael is the question for? Yeah. <laughs> this is the great coordination that happens behind closed doors. <laughs> they, are, they are debating. 
Uh, there's, a, there's a simple technical answer, and then I, I'd love for Michael to kind of get into the design and the vistas of the lake, but the simple answer is the CSX Railroad. There's, there are technical requirements for the height that are higher than the, the highway next to it. So you had to be higher, but there's some great opportunities with the design that, that uh, the firms here um, are really able to take advantage of because of that technical requirement. I agree to what you just said. I think it's almost entirely technical. We have, uh, you know, the CSX, uh, the, the railway. We have the uh, requirements from uh, the highway. And we need to just keep that clearance. Um, and we need to get up there. And we wanted to avoid switchbacks like uh, was done before. Uh, you need to have that distance. And you can do it with switchbacks. But we wanted to, I think, I talk for Michael here. <laughs> Michael wanted to uh, avoid that, and uh, he created um, these berms, basically, so that it's a more natural landscape to get up to this uh, to get up to this height. Um, that's basically the the the, uh, the major motivation of uh, for that. Somehow, I th I think when w we were deciding together that we were going to say it's mostly a technical answer, but I I. I I want to emphasize that just because you do things for technical reason don't mean that they lack in the value of human experience that drives them also. And a huge, when, when we say the park is accessible, that means that people with um, movement limitations, not just people in wheelchairs, and that's not to diminish people being in wheelchairs, but uh, you know, uh, me and my friends who are cresting on to the last quarter of our life uh, are well aware of lim movement limitations, but we wanted to be sure that approaching the bridge, being on the bridge and leaving it never involved any stairs. So we're always in a ramped, you're, we're always in a, con you, you, you do not ever find stairs when you're coming and going from the bridge. And that, of course, was another dimension of a technical solution. It's really a metric solution to providing accessibility. Um, fair enough. As our last question, let's go back to where we started. Mary Wilson. Bringing, uh, having that personal connection. I would like for you, to, for you to expand more on your motivation in bringing uh, people, um, having that connection, that personal connection with each other in different ways in the park. So, Sue Weideman's not here, right? Um, I don't know if some of you know who Sue is, but uh, she, uh, my background in psychology is that Sue, who used to teach at the University of Illinois, was my thesis advisor in graduate school, where my degree is a, is a landscape architecture degree, but I spent the entire two years focusing on how people use environments. Um, I mean, it was the 70s, what can I tell you? Um, <laughs> We did things like that back then, and maybe we should do more of it. Uh, but I'm totally, uh, uh, I'm as fascinated today as I was earlier in my life um, on what places mean to people and how it changes how they feel. Um, and I think that, you know, if you ask me what a park is, I could describe it in physical terms, but in emotional terms, I think it's a place where for even potentially a very short period of time, you feel like you're someplace else. And that is one of the most important things in being human and dealing with all of the stuff that come at us. And I think people go to parks, you know, it's a cliche to say, but to take a breath. And I never 
understood that more pro profoundly than during the pandemic when I saw people in my neighborhood park, which happens to be Brooklyn Bridge Park, but you know, to go to Brooklyn Bridge Park and see, just not see, feel what it meant to other people. Um, my own personal story is that um, uh, I designed and built a, a playground in the neighborhood where where we were in graduate school that my daughter uh, was a user of. Um, and she, uh, she mostly was very proud of her father's playground, but didn't particularly find it that useful to her <laughs> because she wasn't a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, she was looking for, uh, certain kinds of experiences as a young girl in the playground. And I definitely tipped the scale to more gross motor, active kind of climbing things. It, she wasn't not into it, but it was a huge, it was a very, I mean, it wasn't a, a disappointment for her or for me, but it was a huge learning experience that when you design a park, you have to think about everybody. And I would say in the beginning of my career, the biggest conundrum was you would have a public meeting and you would, it would end and you would say, how, how could a park do all of those things? <laughs> like everybody wants something different. And you figure it out and it makes for, you know, a very complicated place. But a park is great when everybody can go there and do what they want to do. And thanks for asking that because it's, yeah, it's so easy to talk about uh, path widths and tree species and landforms and all that stuff, but it's really how it comes together and makes a place that people feel in their bodies that matters. Thank you. Let's make that the last word of the panel. Oh, Yanni. Yeah. So, f folks, b before you go, just a few practical notes. You have all been given these wristbands, I hope. With those wristbands, you can access a reception with refreshments on the second floor of the Gunlock building. You can get to the Gunlock building across the lawn, or you can go the internal route and through the bridge, the John J. Albright Bridge. So second floor, there's a reception over there. Also, if you want to linger around in a community engagement event, we have our 28th uh, Art Alive happening today on the front lawn. So you're going to see all these fantastic tableaus over there. And I just want to, before closing, thank once again, of course, my fellow panelists and Mary, but also Mary's, Mary Wilson's fellow board members and Dave Egner, the executive um, chairman, uh, the CEO of, uh, of the Rolf C. Wilson Jr. Foundation. It's Dave and his team that make the magic happen. So thank you, Dave.